Oh, hello there. This is my very first voice video. You might have also noticed that I have created a character for myself. So this will be me for the time being, as having a character will better represent my emotions and the message. You might have noticed that this video came out right after a very similar one. While it seems boring and uncreative to remake the same topic, I'd like to address all of the important games in this genre, the groundbreakers, the blockbusters, and the failures. In this very first part of the series, we'll look at the arcade era. Therefore, the years 1982 to 1989. Now sit or lie down, get some popcorn or a bowl of fruit, and let's get into it. The year is 1979, and in a small Japanese company, Namco, you might have heard of them, they made Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, or Galaxian. Two guys named Kuzunori Sawano and Shinjiro Okamoto were looking at the mechanical game called F-1 released in 1976 and thinking it needs an upgrade. Sawano showed Okamoto his rough sketches of the game he had in mind and Okamoto very much liked what he was seeing, so they began development. <sighs> the good old days when two friends could just group together and make a AAA game in a shed. I wasn't alive back then. They then invited Sho Osugi, the creator of F-1. With the power of three determined Japanese spirits, they embarked on this journey, not having a clue what lied ahead. Okamoto wanted the game to use a 3D perspective and realistic driving physics, so the players can use real techniques to race. Now this proved really difficult, considering it was 1979 and the best racing games at the time looked like this. The F1 cars of that era also looked like this. That was long ago, man. They decided to add Fuji Speedway, a real track in Japan, in order for the player to recognize and memorize it, possibly carrying the knowledge into the real world. Ah? Huh? Ah? Huh? Same racing. This was the first time a real racing circuit made it into a video game. The development itself took three years. Three years! In comparison with modern day technology, you could probably replicate this game in two days. Okamoto even remembers the president of Namco, Masaya Nakamura. I know it's getting a bit confusing with all the Japanese names, but stay with me. The president of Namco himself criticized them for making it too hard to keep the car moving in a straight line. That's how realistic Okamoto wanted it to feel. However, they had to push the technology of the era, as the game was quote, too ambitious to run on older hardware. The team used not one 8-bit processor, not two 8-bit processors, not even 10 8-bit processors. They used two 16-bit processors. Now, for us this might sound ridiculously low, but for the time being using two 16-bit processors for an arcade game was unheard of. With the development finally going smoothly and reaching the end, they encountered one final dilemma. The gear shift. They couldn't agree on the solution they would use. An automatic gearbox? Nah. That's too simple. A proper realistic manual gearbox? But it's 1981 and those are close to impossible to make yet. The team had long fights over what the gear shift would look like. They eventually settled on a simple gearbox featuring high speed mode and a low speed mode. With the final dilemma settled and the lost friendships reborn, it was time to release this jewel. Namco released Pole Position on September 16, 1982 in Japan, while Atari Incorporated released the game on November 30, 1982 in North America. And boy did it slay up! The gameplay was unbelievable for that time, as you are in complete control slash in control of this lovely F1 car. You have to complete a time trial lap before starting the race, as in real world qualifying. Your time would then determine your starting position on the grid, and if you didn't make it in less than 73 seconds, you'd find yourself running out of time and game over you don't even get to race. If you were able to break the 58.5 second barrier though, you'd start on the pole position. After qualifying, you race 7 opponents for 4 laps while trying to avoid running wide or hitting the billboards. It was awesome and the reception was nothing short of outstanding. The video games magazine called it quote, an ultimate test of driving skill for only the very best video game roadsters. And the electronic games magazine praised its solid, realistic graphics. Take that, Gran Turismo 7! 
The game backed these facts selling over 21,000 machines to the US alone, resulting in $61 million in profit, while the machines averaged $9.5 million per week. $9.5 million weekly, that's $27 million in today's money. Pole Position eventually got the Coinop Game of the Year award in 1983 and left us with a message. People loved games that replicated real life experience and that they were here to stay. It was also the time when Namco discontinued all of their mechanical games as they saw the future of arcade racers in video games. After a year in 1983, Pole Position 2 was released, featuring more tracks and improved graphics, topping the reviews once again. But in the same year, yet another groundbreaking game was already in development. A game studio by the name of Tasmi was almost done with their own game inspired by Pole Position. They called it TX1 and boy was it amazing! TX1 was the first ever racing game to feature three monitors, enabling even more immersion. Just, just look at it! Look at it! It was also the first game to feature force feedback, where the wheel would vibrate the more you turn. Of course, it wasn't accurate, but it was there. And on top of that, they upgraded the physics by a lot. You now had to break and downshift before a corner, unlike pole position, where you could just yank the wheel to the side and the car would stick. If you applied too much throttle during a corner, the car would lose traction and you'd have to release it to get back in control of the car. Wow. Such progress in a year would never happen today. Tasmi eventually licensed the game to Namco, where many would go to see the game as pole position Position's spiritual successor. The content of the game wasn't much different from pole position. You run qualifying and if you do it fast enough you'll get into the race. These improvements obviously didn't go unnoticed and the Game Machine magazine would feature the game in Best Hit Games 25 where it would be the only one to get more than 9 out of 10 points. It would then go to dominate this chart for another 6 months straight. The computer and video games magazine called it possibly the most sophisticated racing simulation game on the market to date and a thrilling game. A year later in 1984, a sequel TX1 V8 was released with more tracks and improved gameplay. These sequels are never a big hit because they usually just feature the same game with more content and we've got updates doing that job today. And Namco's rival company. Sega, a young developer by the name of Yu Suzuki, didn't like Namco getting all that attention and decided to make a realistic racing game himself. He was inspired by Freddie Spencer, a 21-year-old motorcycle racer that went to win the GP500 on a Honda bike. Suzuki wanted to create a game about racing motorcycles but not just any game. He went all the way to create a motion controlled game where you have a motorcycle replica that you use to control the bike on screen. And so, hang on, was born and released in 1985. Suzuki stated the name of the game was chosen when he was reading a magazine about bike racing, about a technique called hang on. However, only after the release did he find out that the technique is actually called hang off in North America. Oops. But anyway, he decided to keep the name. Sega released two versions of the game, one with handlebars only, the normal version, and the deluxe version with the entire bike replica. They also used 16-bit graphics, a fancy decision at the time, and created a fake 3D effect using sprites, something that would eventually settle as 2.5D. The reception wasn't so great at the time of the release though. This is the first game on this list that received criticism, and boy was it controversial. The media said it was quote, inappropriate for Japanese culture as people were normally super shy at the time, and the prediction said that nobody would straddle in front of others, especially for girls in miniskirts, this idea was outrageous. But all the accusations and criticism were gone as soon as the media saw lines of people waiting to play this game. You could also say that this game moved the Japanese culture forward by a baby step. Suzuki's goal became a reality after such a long time Namco's dominance was finally gone. In our favorite Game Machine magazine, it took first place in Best Hit Games 25 with a rating of 9.5 out of 10. You can also notice that the original TX1's rating fell all the way down to 5.4. That just shows how crazy fast the game industry was evolving in the 80s. The Playmeter magazine went all the way to declare it one of the top two games of 1985. Also notice the price for a gallon of gas? Those were cheap times. And in the computer and video games magazine, you could find a quote saying, Hang on combines the suburb graphics of a pole position style race with the physical act of riding a bike. It's great, made for speed, nuts, and best of all, you don't even need a driving license. 
But Suzuki's work didn't stop there. He knew that to cover the motorsport market, he had to create a game with cars, as there were many bike haters in Japan at the time. He loved the movie Cannonball Run, which was based on a real-life outlaw event where drivers raced across the United States from New York to California. Donut Media made a great podcast about this event, which I definitely recommend you listen to. I'll leave a link to it somewhere. Suzuki needed a way to make his game stand out from the massive racing games that emerged after pole position success. He slapped you into the seat of a Ferrari Testarossa Spider, probably the hottest convertible ever made, put a hot soundtrack on and just let you enjoy the drive into the sunset. He called the game OutRun. This was the first ever reactive hydraulic motion simulator, one of the millions we can see today. Predictably, it was a huge success, topping countless reviews and along with Hang On, granted Sega dominance over the 80s. OutRun eventually won the 1987 Golden Joystick Award for the Game of the Year, that's a mouthful, and has been listed as one of the best games of all time by magazines such as Next Generation, Time, Clove, Games Radar, Yahoo, 1001 video games you must play before you die, and many more that were deleted already and I couldn't find them online. IGN later mentioned it in their top 5 most influential racing games in 4th place with pole position at the top of the list. Wow, that's quite a portfolio Suzuki's made for himself. Also you can play most of these games online for free, so I'll leave some links in the description in case you're interested. We now move to a not so successful title, Full Throttle slash Top Speed. It was called Full Throttle in Japan and Top Speed in North America. And for some reason unknown to mankind, in Europe, it was both. Like, wh why? Why? Anyway, this game developed by Taito in 1987 was pretty much a copy of Outrun. You are put behind the wheel of a red sports car, this time a red Mazda RX-7, and you're free to roam American countryside at crazy speeds. It seems like a complete Outrun ripoff, but this one had something more. Something extra. This one thing is the only reason it made it on this list, Nitro Boost. Now as far as I know, this is the first ever game to feature Nitro Boost, a mechanic that would define an entire genre of arcade racers later on. Irregardless of the impact this would have on the future, the reviews at the time were mixed. The computer and video games magazine loved it saying, quote, it's a realistic racing game with great graphics and smooth handling. It's also addictive and offers quite a challenge. On the other hand, the Commodore user magazine stated that, quote, nobody's going to be fooled by such cosmetic differences. Full throttle is a clone. Oh boy, they had no idea of the impact that one button would have on the evolution of racing games. Also, if you look at other games flyers, full throttle was ahead of its time too, although in quite an odd fashion. So I guess you could call this game a failure for being too futuristic? I don't know. Let's move on to a more appreciated game that is WEC Le Mans, released in 1986 by Konami. This game, along with Out1, is remembered for dominating the Amusement Traders Exhibition International in 1987 in London. And what for? As the name suggests, you are put behind the wheel of a Le Mans prototype car to race in the famous 24 hour of Le Mans. If you don't know about this event, you've either been living under a rock or just got into motorsport, in which case, welcome! I hope you like it. This game featured improved force feedback along with jumps and bumps on the road. The steering wheel would vibrate differently if you drove on different surfaces or bumps. The games become known to be incredibly difficult, whereas any mishap like touching the car in front, applying brakes or throttle too hard, even driving off the track would cause you to spin. Now the public reception was good, nothing special though. A Top Score magazine stated that it was quote, unfortunately overshadowed by Outrun's excellence. A Spanish magazine Micro Hobby wrote this, addiction 80%. How do you even rate addiction? With the arcade game industry booming, the home system industry couldn't hesitate and had to innovate to catch up. Checkered Flag, released in 1983 for the ZX Spectrum, an 8-bit personal computer, was one of the pioneers. 10 different tracks to choose from, 3 different cars to pick from, 2 of which were Ferretti as Ferrari and McFaster for McLaren. <laughs> Ah, uh, you gotta love McFaster. Spam hashtag McFaster in the comments. While driving, you had to look after your fuel and avoid overheating the engine. This game also used actual pit stops, which would repair any damage and refuel your car. The graphics do look a lot worse than the arcade games did, but you have to remember the hardware limitations that just couldn't be pushed as freely. Now, as much as Checkered Flag was advanced, it didn't save it from being boring. No opponents on the track caused the game to feel serious in an era where game's sole purpose was to have fun. 
Today, more and more people are focusing on improving their lap times in various sims, but that scene simply didn't exist in the 80s. The reception was still great though, with many reviewers loving the game, but others, such as the Crash Magazine stated, quote, the game itself is pretty good, but it's a little too serious if you're looking for race fun, as you're the only car on the track racing against the clock. Fun fact, in Poland this game was called which means highway races. But the game is neither taking place on a highway, nor are there any races. You okay there, my Polish bros? What checkered flag was missing? Refs, made up for a year later. In 1984, Acornsoft took the quest of creating a racing simulator where you can actually race opponents. The odd thing about Revs was that it was based around the British F3 championship, not F1, as most of the other games. You'll see why in a bit, but this game has a bunch of world's firsts, so let's look at them. First racing game to feature aerodynamic settings, where you can adjust the angle of your wings. First racing game to give its NPCs a character and hilarious names. For example, Gloria Slap, Max Throttle or Johnny Turbo were usually those leading the pack, but miles behind was always the slowest on the grid. Acornsoft was also the first game studio to sponsor an F3 team, sponsoring David Hunt, the younger brother of James Hunt. Despite its innovations, Revs never really took off outside of the UK. Probably because it features an exclusive British championship? Maybe. Maybe because it was released for the BBC Micro, which stands for British Broadcasting Corporation Microcomputer System. So I imagine not many people outside the UK owned it. I really don't know. If you're watching this video and owned any of these old systems, share everything with us in the comments. I'd love to read about it. Going back to the arcade games, the developers went absolutely wild. In 1988, Namco released yet another F1 game that took three years to develop, Winning Run. This was a big one, and everyone knew it at first sight. It was the first game to run on Namco System 21, capable of rendering 3D shaded polygons, so for that time, the graphics were the best, no doubt. Apart from looking absolutely beautiful, Winning Run would offer you two modes to choose from, easy and technical, where technical was obviously the more realistic one. The gameplay was simple yet again, qualify their race 12 opponents. What was different this time though? The opponents weren't as easy to overtake as before. According to the Computer and Video Games magazine, you needed actual skill to pass your opponents, quote, rather than simply overtake them like you do in Outrun and Final Lab, and Winning Run is easily the best racing game yet seen. It's thoroughly realistic and totally exhilarating. Drive it. This game was so successful that it later got two sequels. It's obvious that people loved it and that Namco was at the top of the racing genre once again, which Atari didn't like. Only two months after the release of Winning Run, Atari released Hard Driving. Just like Outrun, it featured a Ferrari Testarossa with which the player would race. It also took action off the track on public roads and made it even more interesting by adding road hazards and stunt loops. From the information available, this may be the first game ever to implement instant replay after a collision or a big crash. As a direct competitor of Winning Run, the opinions were divided into two camps, one for each game. The Crash magazine gave Hard Driving a 92% mark and Euro Sinclair magazine listed it as number one game of 1989. The thing that would push Hard Driving just a bit higher than Winning Run is the fact that it was later released on multiple consoles, spreading its availability. While it might look that Namco and Atari dominated the genre, don't forget about Sega. Sonic the Hedgehog was already out and selling, so Sega had money to burn. Tom Petit from Sega of America stated in an interview for the Vending Times magazine that Sega was quote, hiring 400 new engineers to research and develop new technology. And that would apparently make even their latest arcade racer at the time, Super Monaco GP, quote, seem like the yesterday of technology. You can probably tell that this is the time when the real cash was already being poured into the gaming industry. This new technology combined with Yu Suzuki's desire to create yet another groundbreaker resulted in one of the most influential games of all time. Virtua Racing was released on March 22nd, 1992 and immediately shocked everyone. The new technology delivered and the graphics were just amazing. It was no doubt the prettiest game of its time. As you can tell, this was yet another F1 game featuring qualifying, races, and pit stops. The game was challenging, enjoyable, realistic, and beautiful. You could wish for no more in 1992. It topped so many reviews, I can't include them all without making the video seven hours long. Just look at the list of reviews and awards it has on Wikipedia only. Sega delivered on its promise, and even though they released later than everyone else, they dominated the market once again. Later in 2015, IGN would then list it as the third most influential racing game of all time. Virtual racing would remain a legend, and some people would see it as the very first proper sim racing game. There is no such thing as an official first sim racer. 
but this virtual title was snatched by a game that would never be released for arcades. I'll cover this game and many more in the next video, where we'll be talking about the emergence of Sim Racers. Just so I don't forget, some honorable mentions that didn't make it into this video, but still deserve the spot. Final Lab, Daytona USA, The Dual Disc Drive 2, Super Hang On, Enduro Racer, Rad Racer, Super Monaco GP, Pit Stop 2, and many many more that carried the genre through its early evolution. Of course, I can't name all of them, but feel free to mention the game you think deserves a spot in the Hall of Fame. I sincerely hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, be sure to leave a like, comment, and hit the subscribe button so you don't miss the next part. Until then, goodbye.